Chapter 22 Plans Hey there, Brock. Sorry I haven't been around much. I was off visiting my folks in Arizona, and they're getting up there in age, so I spend as much time with them as I can. Looks like you've been doing pretty good without me, though. Brock led Mr. Armisen into the front room. Yeah, it's getting there. I feel kind of weird giving you a tour since it's your house. Mr. Armisen, a slight, balding man in his fifties, touched one of the cleaned and patched plaster walls thoughtfully. I can't hardly recognize it. Last time I was here, it was a hellhole. Everything's repainted inside, floors sanded and stained, some electrical work, all the outlets and switches are working now. Remember how much garbage was in here? Mr. Armisen nodded. We must have taken out a dozen dumpster loads of trash, me and Zane. Mr. Armisen looked at Brock. Hey, I'm real sorry to hear about your friend, by the way. Thank you, sir. There was a sudden sound from upstairs, like a long, creaking groan. What was that? Mr. Armisen asked. He looked alarmed. Probably just the cat, said Brock. I'll go get him. He ran upstairs and returned with Spooky. He likes to open closet doors that aren't shut all the way. The cat whined and tried to wriggle free from Brock's grasp. The tour continued. In the kitchen, Mr. Armisen tried faucets on the sink, the burners on the stove, and the dishwasher's cleaning cycles. He seemed impressed that everything was in working order. This is amazing, Mr. Armisen said. I knew this old place had potential. There was another low creak, followed by a loud bang that reverberated through the house and even shook the walls a bit. Mr. Armisen jumped. Jesus, he said. Is that the pipes? Nah, probably just something fell over. Mr. Armisen went into the first floor bathroom and flushed the toilet, listening for any out-of-place sounds. There was nothing. It happens every now and then, comes from different spots in the house. Nothing to worry about, Brock said. I am worried about it. Could be a plumbing problem. And anyways, it's kind of creepy. If that sort of thing bothers you, I couldn't recommend sleeping over here, Brock said with a chuckle. He led Mr. Armisen into the annex where he and Zane had spent their first night in the house. What do you mean? Brock shrugged. It's an old house. Lots of weird noises. Like what? Depends. Sometimes just creaks and cracks, like the house is settling. Sometimes it sounds more like footsteps, whispering, things like that. You've got to be joking. Nah, you get used to it after a while. Um, that ain't something I would ever get used to. Mr. Armisen pointed to the floor of the annex. This is where they found her, you know. Veronica Glazer? Brock nodded. That explains a lot. Sometimes I walk into this room and just get a weird cold chill for no reason. Brock led Mr. Armisen upstairs where the older man peeked into his bedroom and each of the empty rooms in turn. Mr. Armisen looked out one of the windows. Outside of the house still needs some work, he said. Yeah, I'll get that finished up when the weather turns nice again. There was another sound, this time a tinkling laugh, far away but quite distinct. Spooky's ears perked up. What is going on in here? That was definitely someone laughing. You sure you don't have a TV on upstairs or something? Yeah, I never even had cable hooked up, and we don't get any channels over the air. Radio? Nope. Mr. Armisen was tugging at his rusty beard. This is not good. Is it always like this? Sometimes I don't hear anything for a long time. Sometimes it gets worse when I bring a new person to the house. They went upstairs to the attic. Brock had repaired the broken wood around the frame where he kicked in the door so many months ago and added a new lock. Mr. Armisen stopped at the doorway while Brock entered and pulled the string of a hanging bulb, casting a small glow to hold the dark shadows at bay. Mr. Armisen refused to follow. This room gives me the creeps, he said. This is where Zane stayed. It's okay. Now there was a noise from downstairs, like the sound of someone dragging a heavy chair across the wood floor. Mr. Armisen looked like he wanted to jump out of his skin. You know, 
in Indiana, there's a real estate law that says you have to tell potential buyers if a house is haunted, he said. Supposedly haunted, Brock corrected him. You ever seen anything? Brock thought for a minute. Candles go out by themselves sometimes. I don't know. The cat tracks things around the room like he's watching something I can't see. Sometimes I'll catch shadows out of the corner of my eye. Suddenly, all of the power went out in the house, and the attic collapsed into darkness. Mr. Armisen shouted something unintelligibly. Brock could hear him pounding down the stairs. Wait! Brock called. Don't fall! He set the cat down and followed as quickly as he could. He found Mr. Armisen outside on the porch, breathing heavily, his hands on his knees. I'm never going to sell this house, he shouted. It isn't usually that bad, Brock said. It's a good house. Well, I'm glad you like it, because no buyer in their right mind is going to make an offer on a place that's got ghosts in every room. Come on, Mr. Armisen. Place needs an exorcism. Brock looked down, embarrassed. Actually, we tried that already. He tried that already. You tried that already? It's cold out here, man. Let's go back inside and sit down. I ain't going back in that house. It's fine, really. Probably a totally rational, logical explanation. Yeah, right. Mr. Armisen spat over the porch rail. I may not even be able to make back the money I paid for it. Plus all the money I gave you to fix it up and taxes. He looked like he was hyperventilating. I'll buy it from you, said Brock. Mr. Armisen stopped freaking out for a second and stared at him with surprise. Huh? Yeah. I tell you what, I'll pay you twice what you bought it for at auction. Thirty-six thousand dollars. Plus, I'll pay you back what you already gave me for the work. On top? And taxes? That too. Can you even get a mortgage? Brock nodded. Sure. He really hoped that he was telling the truth. You're not scared. Brock smiled. I think Mrs. Glazer just doesn't like you. She's cool with me. The glass in the front window started to rattle of its own accord. Mr. Armisen leapt from the porch to the ground. His feet didn't even touch the steps. He backed away from Brock and the house. Give me three times what I paid, and it's yours. Go to the bank, see if they'll approve you, and let me know. I'm getting out of here. Mr. Armisen jumped into his car and roared off down the drive. Brock returned to the warm house. Thank you, Mrs. Glazer he said, pulling a small device from his pocket. It was a remote that he'd purchased from a discount electronics store, studded with eight small push buttons. Each was linked by a specific radio frequency to a receiver elsewhere in the house. Remote switches that could trip circuit breakers, motors that tipped stacks of heavy books, even pulley systems that could slowly drag a nightstand across the floor. Brock had engineered all of these ghosts with spare parts from the basement. Six of the buttons had been activated, the illusion worked so well that he didn't even need to use the remaining two. The following weeks were a whirlwind of activity. Brock went to the bank with a down payment and a plan. He would divide the first and second floors of the house into four separate living spaces by changing locks on the doors, strategically adding and subtracting walls, and moving his own belongings to the attic. That would be his room now. The others would be rented out. He knew that the rooms wouldn't really be full apartments. There were only two bathrooms, so they'd all have to share. The kitchen and living room would be communal as well, and so he couldn't charge his renters as much as the owner of an apartment building could. It would be more like having four roommates. He thought $350 per month sounded about right. That would bring in about $1,400 total. At first, the bank balked at giving Brock a mortgage. They were concerned about the holes in his employment history, as well as the income he'd be without since Mr. Armisen would no longer be paying him to work on the house. But Brock brought a detailed financial statement and a written cost breakdown. He'd give the bank $32,500, half the cost up front as a down payment, out of the windfall received from the Truax family. Then the loan could be paid with money from his renters, and he'd still have plenty left over. 
the bank finally accepted and offered him a decent interest rate with a monthly payment of only $400. That meant $1,000 every month for the foreseeable future. That's how much Brock would have left to spend each month on gas, groceries, incidentals, and the second part of his grand scheme. Brock pushed a thumbtack through his flyer and into the community bulletin board on the wall at Gurley's place. There were hundreds of other flyers, business cards, and advertising pamphlets pinned there already, but Brock thought his stood out. He'd added a big picture of Spooky's head to the top of the page. The cat looked like he was smiling, and maybe he was. Brock had enticed him to sit for the photo with half a can of tuna. My cat needs a cool roommate. Spacious, newly remodeled rooms for rent in historic home. Downtown Broadacre. Walking distance to amenities. Shared kitchen and bath. $350 per month. Cheap. Must tolerate cats. Contact Brock DeKalb. At the bottom, Brock had printed his name and phone number on 20 little tear strips. He stepped back to admire his handiwork. It looked pretty good. Very nice, called Gurley, who was behind the front counter, refilling the regulars' coffees. I'd rent one of those rooms from you if I didn't already have a place. You are too kind, he replied. Did you see the paper this morning? Nope. Why? Look at page four, Gurley said. Brock dug through the piles of local and regional newspapers that Gurley kept for the customers, looking for today's issue. Oh, find the Renault City paper, the Daily Reporter. Not the Sun and Herald. He located the appropriate item. There, on page four, was a quarter-page spread with Wisteria's picture at the top. Her eyes were covered by a mask made of large, sparkly hearts that would have concealed her identity to most. But Brock knew. The dress she also wore betrayed her secret. It was the one that Zane had given her. Translucent costume wings completed the ensemble. Oh my god, what is this? Brock said. Secret Cupid Inspires Campus on Valentine's Day by Min Ji Yoon, staff writer, Renault, Indiana. Renault University was feeling the love on Thursday as an anonymous student handed out roses near the Summers Fountain on State Street, along with an unusual request. She asked me to give the rose to someone who needs it. I told her I don't have a girlfriend, so she suggested I give it to someone who looks like they could use it. Or someone I liked for a long time but could never tell, said Mohal Raj, a junior in chemical engineering. The Renault Daily Reporter estimates that the mysterious Cupid distributed around 300 roses to passerby. It probably would have been weird if it was just me randomly giving a rose to someone, said Michelle Kornbluth, a sophomore in biology. But word got around campus fast. Everybody knew about it. Everybody was doing it. Kornbluth gave her rose to Yvonne Joseph, a maintenance worker at Wellmeyer Hall. The female responsible for the roses repeatedly refused to give her name or otherwise identify herself, other than to say that she was a student at Renault University and a freshman. Skylar Logan Jr., a senior geology major, planned on giving the rose to his girlfriend. Let me do a shout-out. Claire, happy Valentine's Day. Can you print that? He asked. In fact... Nearly everyone interviewed told us that they appreciated the gesture and felt that it contributed to a spirit of camaraderie on the otherwise conservative Renault campus. Well, I'm surprised and I'm not surprised, Brock said, sliding into a booth. I know, Gurley poured Brock a cup of coffee. I was afraid she'd quit doing her thing when she went off to college, but it looks like she's still at it. If I had a rose, I'd give it to you, Gurley, Brock said. Oh, stop. You're just trying to get me to tear up your bill. And it's working. Brock feigned indignation. I would never do such a thing. Besides, my days of begging for free coffee are over. I'm independently wealthy now. I know it. What are you going to do with all that money? You'll be able to swim around in it like that old duck in the cartoons. Brock turned serious. I'm going to run for mayor. Curly laughed. Well, you got my vote, mister. Brock raised his eyebrows but said nothing. Oh my god, are you pulling my leg, Brock? Are you for real? Brock nodded. Mayor Moon is retiring. He used to run unopposed. I think I've got a pretty good shot. Gurley looked concerned. 
But Brock, do you really think people want? I I mean, do you think people are going to be ready, ready for a a black mayor? I mean, I'm fine with it, but you know how it is. There are lots of other folks who are kind of set in their ways. They might have a problem with that. Would they even vote for you? Brock liked Gurley a lot, but she could really make him grind his teeth in irritation sometimes. White people always thought they had to explain things like this to him, like he wasn't constantly aware. Well, if I'm the only candidate, they don't have much of a choice. And what if you're not? Then maybe I'll just have a platform to influence policy. Third-party candidates do it all the time. They know they don't have a real shot, but staying in the race gives them a megaphone. If I can get people thinking a little bit, that's a start at least. I just don't want to see you get hurt or anything, physically or mentally. Brock waved off the suggestion. This is part of my therapy, too. Wisteria made me take up some sort of a big project to keep my mind busy. It's supposed to help with the panic attacks. Winning would be nice, but that's secondary. Is it working? Mm, seems like it. Well, said Gurley, everyone needs a hobby, I guess. Brock clenched his jaw and forced a smile. You're going to need the right clothes, Gurley said. Do you have a suit? Nice shoes? I bought dress shirts and ties a long time ago. Dress pants. When I was interviewing for my real job, my engineering job. Brock gestured to his stomach. But I've put on a little weight since then. Better put aside some of that money to update your wardrobe. Jeans and sweatshirts aren't going to cut it. The way someone dresses can tell you a lot about them. Brock suddenly felt self-conscious. I thought... I thought maybe I'd be the relatable candidate, you know? The working class guy. Simple. Not pretentious. Wear my regular clothes. Brock, you're going to hate me for saying this. And I'm telling you as a friend, you already got some disadvantages. You're young. You're... You don't look like most people around here. You think I don't already know? Don't handicap yourself anymore. They don't want a working class guy. You'll need to be somebody these folks can look up to. A leader. Somebody who knows how to make an impression. But that's not who I am. It's who you want to be, right? Brock nodded. Why did you buy fancy new clothes for your interviews? You dressed for the job you want. This is turning out to be a lot more involved than I thought it would be, said Brock. I just had an idea, though. You want to be my campaign manager? Gurley wiped her hands on her apron and headed off to the kitchen. I think I'll pass on that. I hate politics anyway. Brock, in his new gray suit, rang the doorbell of the first house on 5th Street. Hello, my name is Brock DeKalb and I'm running for mayor. Congratulations, not interested. The homeowner closed the door quickly before Brock had a chance to respond. Hi, I'm Brock DeKalb. I'm running for mayor of Broadacre, and I'm wondering if I could have a few minutes of your time to discuss my platform. Um, which political party are you with? I'm running as an independent, but I'd be happy to... Nah, I'm good. Thanks anyway. Brock DeKalb, nice to meet you. I'm collecting signatures to get my name on the ballot in November. What office are you running for? I'm a mayoral candidate. Ain't you a little young? I'm 25 years old, sir. <laughs> Why don't you try again in about 20 years? After the first week of canvassing the town, Brock had 127 signatures. Broadacre required 2,000 in order to have one's name printed on the ballot. Luckily for his mental health, Brock had better luck with interest from potential renters. Kurt Magnum stopped by for an interview on a drizzly Monday toward the end of February. He hadn't really dressed up for the occasion, but wore a beanie with a potleaf patch, a knit vest over a faded t-shirt, and red and white striped pants that were too short for his gangly legs. He was barefoot. Brock took one look and knew that he was going to have to set some ground rules. I'm a musician, Kurt said. Will it be okay for me to practice here, in the house? 
Yeah, sure, man. I don't see why not. I mean, we'd have to have quiet hours at some point, maybe after 8 or 9 o'clock. Cool, cool. Do you care if I jam outside on the porch? Nope, that's fine with me. I like to be outdoors. Out in the world, you know. Isn't it a little cold out there in the winter? Nah, not for me. Once you've ridden an open box car over the Rocky Mountains, everything else seems balmy in comparison. Kurt laughed, a big horsey guffaw. A train box car? Are you a, you know, one of those hobos? You could say it. It's a badge of honor, dude. And yeah, gonna stick around town for a while? Sure, I'm good for a year. Want to make some money, write some songs. After that, we'll see. Fair enough. Got any questions for me? Kurt smiled. Are you, uh... He pantomimed the smoking of an invisible cigarette. 420 friendly? Brock wasn't sure that he was exactly, but he didn't want to offend Kurt or come across as cranky or authoritarian. I guess. I don't have a problem with it. Not in the common areas, though. Can you keep it in your room? No problem. Well, I guess we have a deal, then. If you can give me the first month's rent, I'll hand you a key and you can have your pick of the rooms, since you're my first renter. Kurt opened a wallet held together by duct tape and counted out $350 in crumpled bills. He chose Brock's old room on the second floor. Christy Hess was the next to visit, several days later with eight-month-old son Beckett in her arms. She looked to be in her late twenties, Brock guessed, and she was constantly hushing and bouncing the baby at her shoulder to keep him pacified. Beckett himself was hidden from view, wrapped in several layers of blankets. He's a quiet little guy, Christy said. We won't be any trouble. Wouldn't be keeping you awake at night. She was attractive, even with her harried mom look, face without makeup, sandy hair pulled back into a messy bun, and dark circles under her eyes. No ring on her finger. Nice body, too, one that she was showing off in a tight, low-cut top, though Brock felt a little weird about checking out a single mother. The top probably allowed easy access for the kid. Yeah, Brock was staring. Yeah, that's no problem. A little noise doesn't bother me anyway. He snapped back to reality. So tell me about you. Well, I'm just a nice Christian lady who works hard, trying to provide for my son. I'm tidy, want to be helpful where I can. You're saying all the right things. She smiled. Okay, so that brings up a question. You can say no if you want, but would you be willing to accept a little less money for the room every month if I did some housework, cleaning, maybe some cooking in exchange? How much less? I don't know. How does $250 a month sound? Kurt barged in at that moment, struggling to navigate a wooden rocking chair through the front door. He was the king of dumpster diving. Brock figured he'd learned it as a survival skill when he was riding the rails. In only a few days, he'd furnished nearly his entire room with items scavenged from the trash all over town. Watch out, Spooky! Kurt yelled. Don't want to squish ya! The cat was in the basement eating his lunch at the time, but it was a fair warning. Spooky loved Kurt. He followed Kurt everywhere and spent more time in Kurt's room listening to the lazy guitar strumming than he had in Brock's room recently. Kurt grunted, dropped the chair in the middle of the living room, and wiped away the sweat that had collected in his heavy eyebrows. The noise roused Beckett, and he started to fuss a bit. Kurt's eyes lit up. Can I hold the little guy? he asked. Kids love me. I guess so, sure, said Christy who looked a bit alarmed to be handing her child over to a dirty, sweating hippie, but relented. Brock stared at the ceiling and thought for a moment. How about this? he said in a whisper. He didn't want Kurt to overhear the deal-making. Three hundred dollars a month, and I'll pay your share of the utilities. Christy looked pleased. You have no idea what a big help that'd be. Kurt was across the room at one of the large windows, showing Beckett the downhill view toward town. You want to learn how to play the harmonica, bro? He asked the baby. I'll teach you. Beckett farted. Well, when do you want to move in? 
I'll get the money from Beckett's dad this afternoon. So, maybe tomorrow? Is that too soon? Works for me. Brock shook her hand as she stood. Kurt was spinning Beckett around in slow circles, making monkey noises, and the baby was cackling. Okay, Kurt, Brock said. Give the child back to the nice lady now. Oh, you gotta go? He handed his new friend back to its mother. Are you coming back, little dude? He will, Brock said. This is Christy and Beckett. They're going to live on the first floor. Killer! He can be in my band. I got a little maraca he could totally shake. Kurt rocked back on his heels and accidentally stepped on the tail of Spooky, who had quietly padded upstairs after eating his fill of dry kibble. The cat screamed at top volume and raced off. Christy jumped. Spooky, come back! Kurt shouted, loping after the cat. I didn't mean it! This is going to be interesting, Brock thought. There's still two rooms left to fill, and the place is already a madhouse. But he was getting used to the idea. It was a fun kind of craziness. The house liked it, too. It was nice to have life within its walls. Nice to be useful again. When Brock first cast eyes upon Albert Kessler, he figured the old man wasn't even going to make it inside the house, much less want to rent a room there. Brock watched from behind a curtain as Albert parked his ancient sedan in the driveway and opened the door. He swung his legs out, one by one, lifting each with his arms and setting it firmly on the ground. Then he took a knotty wooden cane from the passenger seat and poked it into the gravel, trying to find the best hold. Grasping the door and leaning heavily upon his cane, he climbed to a standing position, closed the door firmly, and then began to trek toward the stairs. He moved purposefully, if slowly, coming to a full stop between each step. Brock wondered if he shouldn't just pick the guy up and carry him. He opened the front door. Hello, sir, he called. You must be Albert. Don't rush me, son. I'll get there. Albert wasn't taking any chances with the front steps. He'd lift his right foot to the riser, then hoist himself upward with the cane. He lifted his left foot to the same step. Then he'd pause for breath. One step down. There were eight in total. Sorry I don't have an easier way to get inside, Brock said. Eh, I don't have anything else to do this afternoon, do you? Brock could have been canvassing the town for signatures this afternoon, but he didn't say so. He was up to 302 on his petition to be included on the ballot. I sure don't, he said. Besides, I knew what I was getting myself into coming out here, Albert said. This house hasn't changed too much since the last time I was here. The last time, sir? You used to live here as a boy. Albert had reached the fifth step. Brock wasn't expecting that. During their initial phone call, Albert hadn't mentioned anything about once living in the place. Seriously? Welcome home. Thank you, Albert replied. He motioned with an arthritic digit. You like cats? Brock followed Albert's pointing finger to find Spooky sitting back on his haunches in the doorway, tail twitching just behind Brock's leg. He'd snuck in without making a sound and was watching the old man curiously. I like this cat, Brock said. I got two of my own. My best friends. Thought I'd have to find them new homes. Albert reached the top step with a grunt and extended a hand to shake Brock's. But maybe they could come with me. What do you think about that? Sure, I don't see why not. Brock answered without really thinking things through. He wasn't sure how Spooky would get along with other cats, or whether this was even a good idea. Cats could be destructive. But it was hard to tell the old guy no after he'd just made such a heroic effort. Brock led him into the living room and helped him fall into a recliner. Albert hung his cane over the armrest and looked around the room brightly. Yep, he said. Looks about right, I reckon. Brock thought there was a wistful tone to his voice. I remember we used to set the Christmas tree up right there in that window. My father'd chop one down along the river, and I'd help him drag it back up those steps once I got old enough. 
Albert blew his nose into a stained handkerchief. Used to put real candles on the tree and light them on Christmas Eve. None of that little bulb crap we got nowadays. Of course, it's kind of a miracle this house never burnt down. Sounds like a nice memory, Brock said. Yep, not always all nice stuff happened, but it was my life. My grandmother died in this house. One of my sisters, too. She fell down the stairs. Lay in her bed on the second floor, hovering between life and death for near close to a week before she passed. Brock shivered. He was glad no one clued him in about that before he spent months living on his own in the house. That's too bad, he murmured, not knowing exactly how to respond. Kurt was practicing upstairs. He launched into a blistering solo on the accordion that he'd found in someone's trash. That noise going to bother you? Brock asked. Albert reached up and turned down the volume on his hearing aid. Can't even hear it. Brock smiled. Okay, I've got one first floor room left. It's yours if you want it. I'd sure appreciate that. My daughter's gonna come by every now and then to check in on me. It okay if she gets a key too? I don't see why not, Brock thought for a moment. Mr. Kessler, is this really the right place for you? Wouldn't you be better off or happier in a in one of those retirement communities? Albert huffed. I got good memories here. I can still get around by myself. Besides, them places are full of old people. For a couple of weeks, there were no inquiries about the last empty room. Brock worried that he might never rent it out. But then there was a call from a young-sounding guy named Denny who wanted to have a look. Brock kept right on worrying when he saw the kids shuffling up the driveway. He didn't have a car or even a bike, apparently. He was short and stocky with an ugly buzz cut. Even though it was early March and still technically winter, Denny was wearing only jeans, boots, and a short-sleeved blue work shirt with tails untucked. There was some sort of patch over the right breast, but Brock couldn't make out what it said. No umbrella or even a coat to protect him against the wind and slanting drizzle. Dumb, he thought. Brock held the door open. You must be Denny. Yep, Denny Birch. He scraped the bottoms of his shoes against the top step to knock off some of the mud and smirked. On the phone, you didn't sound like a black dude. Sorry, disappointed? Brock asked. Whatever. Denny finished cleaning his soles and headed inside, still managing to track watery mud across the hardwood. Brock frowned, thinking about all the cleaning that he'd need to do later. Maybe Christy will get it, Brock thought. She'd been really great about taking care of the house so far. Denny fell onto the sofa and kicked his feet up on the coffee table. At least the drips were falling onto a magazine. I need to get this over with before he can dirty up anything else. As it turned out, Denny wasn't much of a talker. So, what do you do? Brock asked him. Denny pointed to the patch on his shirt. Red block letters inscribed into the oval read, Lawson National, which Brock recognized as a big transport company on the outskirts of town. Hose out the semi-trailers. How old are you? Nineteen. You got any rental references? Nah. Was living with my girlfriend, but she threw me out, though. You can call her if you want. Wonderful, Brock thought. At least he's honest. There was a scar on the kid's temple that made Brock's skin crawl. He looked like one of the little assholes that used to torment him in middle school. Is a second floor room okay? Brock asked. Denny shrugged. Whatever. Brock and Denny locked eyes for a moment, each waiting for the other to speak. Any trouble with the law? Drugs? Anything like that? Nah. Got any questions for me? Nah. Well, okay then, Brock stood. I've got your number, so I'll give you a call once I make a decision. All right. Denny tromped out of the house and off down the street without a second look back.
It seemed like an easy choice, turning this one down. But it had been a long time since anyone showed an interest in that room, and now Brock was getting a conscience. His little chat with Gurley kept popping into his mind, and how she'd lectured him on dressing to make an impression. Up until then, he'd been planning to wear his regular guy clothes to run for mayor. Maybe the kid just didn't have anyone to help him out with those little tidbits of advice. Maybe he didn't know anything about making good impressions. And he was young. It pained him sometimes. But Brock liked to think of himself as a little better than those people who were always looking down on him because they were racist or ageist or whatever. So he didn't want to be like that. Judgmental. He'd show them. Brock wondered if Denny was still interested in the room anyway. Maybe he'd say no. Brock called him. Denny said yes. Well, at least the kid will have some role models here, he laughed at the thought. A hippie, a baby, a single mother, three cats and a geriatric. And me, a panic attack basket case. Brock thought back to his high school days with Zane, Timothy, Jeff, and Daniel. Here he was again, one member of a band of weirdos. The cast-offs of society, exiled to the land of lost toys. Not entirely sure how this keeps happening, Brock thought. But I'll take these guys over all the obnoxious, driven, business-suited winners in the whole state. He wasn't even conscious of it, but Brock was lifting his chin proudly. The house was alive now. It breathed and moved and sang. Music floated from Kurt's room, throughout the hallways, up and down stairwells. Kurt played the guitar, the accordion, the harmonica, the flute. He created his own instruments, too. Percussion from metal cans, the spokes of discarded bicycle wheels, and a rusty oil drum. The sounds of wind instruments were wrung from glass bottles filled with water to varying depths. Brock didn't find Kurt to be naturally talented at any of the instruments other than guitar, but he had to admire the guy's persistence and willingness to experiment. Kurt's wasn't the only music in the house. There were also the rhythms and melodies of daily life. Christy running the vacuum back and forth over the rugs, a fortissimo roar that varied in pitch slightly, depending on whether she was pushing forward or pulling it back. Denny's boots on the stairs every morning beating out a military march cadence as he prepared to leave for work. Left, right, left, right, stomp, stomp. Or Kurt's manic two-step as he descended to the first floor for lunch. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. The pianissimo drones of the dishwasher and clothes dryer that seemed to be constantly running. Beckett's uninhibited staccato laughter. Sometimes there were shouts and crises. One day, Beckett got his chubby fist around a stray band-aid in the living room and decided to taste it, thinking it might be a delicious snack. When Kurt heard him choking, he reached into the little mouth with a long finger and drew it out to become the hero of the hour. At first, there were literal cat fights taking place in the house, but those settled down after a week or two. Albert brought along his furry companions, girl cat and boy cat, explaining that he had been calling them that for so long, he'd forgotten their true names. Besides, they never responded to his calls, so what was the point of giving them real names anyway? Initially, Girl Cat and Boy Cat spent their days pent in Albert's room. Spooky could hear and smell the strange intruders in his house. He hissed and swiped at them through the gap at the bottom of the door. Once that settled down and Spooky got used to the idea of having company, Girl Cat and Boy Cat were allowed to roam the house more freely. There were some epic battles for dominance but once the pecking order was established with Spooky firmly at the top, the cats decided that they could all tolerate each other and were occasionally seen grooming one another or cuddling together in pools of sunlight. Lee's print shop, just down the street, delivered a 35-foot vinyl banner, rolled, that Kurt and Brock hung outside with heavy straps straight across the house's midsection, right between the first and second floors. All the renters gathered on the sidewalk to watch. Even Albert hobbled down the hill to meet the others for the ceremony. When the ties were cut loose, the banner unfurled with a snap. In letters that could be seen from afar by any Broadacre resident who might happen to look up at the old house on a hill, 
It read, Vote DeKalb 2002, a mayor for the past, present, and future. It was perfect, but something in Brock didn't feel quite right. Seeing his name writ large, an advertisement for his personal brand slapped on a giant billboard, made everything seem suddenly more real and immediate. And that brought forth a flood of unknowns, which sprouted and gave birth to questions, until all the queries wrapped his brain like twisting vines, cutting off the circulation and choking out any attempts to rationally question the fears that were throbbing inside. There it was. He had been successfully fending off the panic for weeks, dodging it, parrying its attacks, but it always found a weak point in his defense. Why did I think this was a good idea, he wondered. What if I lose? It's going to be embarrassing now that everyone knows I'm running. And what if I win? I don't know anything about being a mayor. And I spent money on a big stupid sign, so how could I even quit now if I wanted to? Brock rushed ahead of his renters as they climbed back up the hill toward the house. He went straight upstairs into the attic and locked the door. Later that evening, there was a knock. Brock threw off his comforter and sat up slowly. He was dizzy again. How long had it been since he'd done his exercises? It was easy to slack off, once his head cleared and the anxiety subsided, but that led without fail to a vicious spiral of increasing laziness and physical side effects. He padded over to the door in sock-clad feet. It was Kurt, holding a sheaf of papers. Got you some more signatures, dude. Hope you don't mind. There were four signature sheets, all completely full of names. Brock was blown away. You did all this today? Yeah, I needed a break from practicing. Four hundred new signatures? This is more than I collected myself in weeks. I went out to some bars, music store, places like that. Told everybody that you're a young, successful, genius real estate investor who just wants to shake things up with loads of fresh ideas. A real change from the past 50 years in Broadacre. You didn't. It's the truth. It's not really, though. That depends entirely on your perspective, dude. Brock flipped through the sheets of names. A growing realization gripped him, squeezed his stomach, then raced up his spine in hot anger. They signed because they can't see me, and they don't know who I am. They don't want a black mayor. They assumed you were campaigning for a white guy. Kurt took off his beanie and scratched the top of his head vigorously. I wasn't going to say it, but since you brought that up, I don't know. Do they really need to know? Brock huffed. I'd say so. They'll find out sooner or later. Dude, I'd say the priority is getting on the ballot. No one else is running. You win automatically. Figure out the racial thing afterwards. Do a good job and nobody's going to care. Brock thought of Wisteria and her words. His whole project, running for mayor, wasn't about winning or losing. It was to occupy his thoughts and stave off panic. But could it actually make things worse? He wondered. Am I getting in over my head? Will there be too much stress? Could I die from anxiety? But he still had the switch on a cord around his neck to remind him that this project was for his own benefit. Keep working. Keep your mind occupied with a difficult task, he thought. His idle brain, continuously inventing catastrophic future scenarios, was the real enemy. You want to help me out? Brock asked. Trick people into endorsing me for public office? He grinned. Yeah, dude. Can I play for all the folks at your inauguration? Mid-March rolled around, and the world was ready to come alive again. The ice and snow were melting, and soon the first green shoots of leaves and flowers would push up through the hard soil. Brock woke, showered, dressed in his suit, and headed toward the kitchen. The smell of eggs cooking had reached out to him, called his name from all the way downstairs. Christy had turned out to be a pretty decent cook. Only once Brock arrived, it was actually Albert manning the stove. Gave Christy the day off, he said. She needs some sleep. Baby's been keeping her up all night. Kurt was already at the table reading the newspaper when Brock sat opposite him. 
They'd made a lot of headway lately. The official signature count was 1,452. Hey man, you ready to make some big progress today? Kurt nodded without lifting his eyes from the news. We might even finish up, which would be amazing. Uh-huh, Kurt said. We got a problem, though. You seen the news this morning? No, what's the matter? 